Jeffrey Hinton is known as a godfather of artificial intelligence. For the last 10 years, he's helped Google create AI and mentor the industry's rising stars, including OpenAI's chief scientist, Ilya Siskova, and Nick Frost over at Cohere. In fact, Toronto is a global AI hub today in large part because Hinton moved here 40 years ago when the Canadian government agreed to fund his unusual research. I was kind of weird because I did this stuff everybody else thought was nonsense. While others pursuing AI tried to program logic and reasoning into computers, Hinton thought it was better to have them figure things out themselves. The idea was to mimic the brain. With lots of practice, these virtual neural networks illustrated here would make the right connections to solve a given task. There were doubters. The big issue was, could you expect a big neural network that learns by just changing the strengths of the connections? Could you expect that to just look at data and with no kind of innate prior knowledge, learn how to do things? People in mainstream AI thought that was completely ridiculous. It sounds a little ridiculous. It is a little ridiculous, but it works. <laughs> it's all the real. Only in the last decade or so have computers been powerful enough to prove Hinton was right. His machine learning ideas applied to different kinds of training data now create all kinds of outputs. This, of course, isn't Tom Cruise, but a deep fake impersonating him. I went down to the office because they were making a robot of me. This isn't Andy Warhol's voice in the recent Netflix documentary, but a clone generated by Resemble AI. Click record and then read the sentence out loud. After a few minutes, in come between reading training text, it'll go ahead and build this in the background. Founder Zohab Ahmed had cloned my voice too. Habitat for Humanity, which helps homeowners build homes alongside volunteers. Yeah, I definitely hear myself in there. Smile into the camera. A company called Synthesia had me read a script in front of a green screen. They used that video to create this digital version of me. We paired it with Resemble's voice to create a TV reporter who will say anything you type. The technology will only get better in the years ahead. Hello, Using everyone. this tech to spread misinformation to seems angle. inevitable. This is my very first day in Zingwana's agency. Using it to replace journalists and lawyers and accountants and radiologists and novelists and songwriters and painters. Well, that could happen too. Until quite recently, I thought it was going to be like 20 to 50 years before we have general purpose AI. Now I think it may be 20 years or less. Some so. people think it could be like five. I wouldn't completely rule that possibility out now. Whereas pre a few years ago, I would have said, no way. Are we close to the computers coming up with their own ideas for improving themselves? Yes, we might be. And then it could just go fast. That's an issue, right? We have to think hard about how to control that. Yeah, can we? We don't know, we haven't been there yet, but we can try. Okay, that seems kind of concerning. Um, yes. What do you think the chances are of AI just wiping out humanity? It's not inconceivable. Okay. That's all I'll say. How, Hinton wonders, will we manage a technology that could give a handful of companies or governments such awesome power? And so I think it's very reasonable for people to be worrying about those issues now. Even though it's not gonna happen in the next year or two, people should be thinking about those issues. For CBS Saturday Morning, still writing his own script for now, Brooke Silva-Braga, Toronto. Good, two, for you. Good for you, Brooke. Yeah, yeah, right. But two questions, like, why are you building it, one? And two, why aren't you thinking about the possible impact? It's, the, it's this big question mark, and, and, and the rest of us have to deal building with it. Building to try to make life easier. I thought the bigger question was when Brooke asked, what do you think of the possibility of AI wiping out <laughs> exactly. humanity? And the guy says... <laughs> It's not, not inconceivable. <laughs> yeah, I would exactly. agree. Exactly. I mean, my point exactly. Right. I don't think we can answer that in 10 seconds. Yeah. This morning, as part of our series, Age of AI, we are introducing you to a computer scientist who became known in the tech world as the godmother of AI. Fei-Fei Li immigrated to the United States as a child. She documents her rise to the top of her field in a new memoir, The World's I See. Our Jolene Kent cruised Stanford University's campus for a look at the state of artificial intelligence. You have to learn to see it. You have to learn to manipulate it. At the helm of this Stanford University artificial intelligence lab is Professor Fei-Fei Li. Basically training robots. A 47-year-old computer scientist known as the godmother of AI, leading a team of graduate students teaching robots to mimic human behavior. 
Are you comfortable with the title Godmother of AI? No, I'm not. Why I would not? never I would never call myself that. I don't know how to balance my personal discomfort with the fact that throughout history men are always called godfathers of something. Oh, this is cool. Lee has been working on artificial intelligence for almost 20 years, making a major breakthrough when she builds a system to teach computers how to recognize or see millions of images and describe the world around us. She called it ImageNet. There were skeptics out there. You were told by a colleague that ImageNet was too big of a leap, too far ahead of its time. In hindsight, we bet on something we were right about. Our hypothesis of AI needs to be data-driven and data-centric was the right hypothesis. So this is how you get around Stanford? Yeah. Today, she's one of the most important AI researchers leading a campaign that all AI should be driven by people. I'm here uh, today. Lee has taken this urgent message to Congress. There's nothing artificial about artificial intelligence. The scientists are human. I'm a human. And as a piece of technology, uh, be it very powerful, that we need to be grounded to humans. There have been some major mistakes made by AI that you write about in your book. Mm -hmm. You write, it was hard not to feel a twinge of culpability. Well, so first of all, I think recognizing the problem and even taking responsibility is the first step because we are seeing the, the consequences, and many of them are unintended in ushering this technology, I do feel we have more responsibility than just creating the tech. In her new memoir, The World I See, Lee opens up about her deeply personal immigrant story that's inextricably intertwined with the rise of AI. You write in your book that artificial intelligence is something so big and so powerful, so capricious, that it could destroy as easily as it could inspire. AI as a piece of powerful tools, it can be used in the wrong way. I believe in the goodness of people. I believe in the arc of history bends towards justice. I believe in the value system that our country is founded in. Lee is also at the forefront of bringing artificial intelligence to health care and advised President Joe Biden on the urgent need for more public sector funding so the U.S. can become the global leader in AI. How did it happen that you grew up middle class in China, you immigrated to the United States into poverty, and now you are the godmother of AI? I don't know how it happened. <laughs> You're uprooted from everything and the only thing you knew that you don't even know the language. And you, you see the challenges your parents are dealing with. You had a number of jobs yes. on your way here to the yeah. top. You worked at a Chinese restaurant mm -hmm. off the books for mm -hmm. $2 an hour, is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. Your parents started a dry cleaning shop while you were in college. Yeah. And while most kids in college are off studying, you were translating for them, working there. That's about. a norm, yeah. And that was just everyday life? Yeah, that's my everyday life. Her hard work resulted in a nearly full ride to Princeton, where she studied physics and a PhD from Caltech. Today, Lee is raising her two children along with her husband, a fellow computer scientist. And along with her research, she supports AI for All, an organization she co-founded for more diversity in her field. Are you satisfied with what you see so far right now? Oh, no. <laughs> Not at all. We don't have enough uh, diversity in this technology at all. We're seeing improvements. Mm -hmm. There's more women, but the number of students from diverse backgrounds, especially, you know, people of color, we have a long way to go. You've described AI as a phenomenon. Now you call it a responsibility. To me, it's to ensure that it maximizes benefits to all humans. But I don't want to give agency to AI itself. It's going to be used by people, and the power lies within people. For CBS Mornings, Jolyn Kent, Palo Alto, California. So excited. We're all going, mm. go Fei Fei Li. Yes, I like what you sure. said, we have to be more responsible than just creating the tech. Anytime you see somebody who fully understands this business, AI and is working in the business and saying we need to be more responsible, I'm all for this. Yeah. I mean, there's she, so much we still don't know. Yes, we do need to be more responsible. She's excited. She's an optimist. I'm 10 out of 10 worried and also 10 out of 10 excited. Yeah, but yeah. also worried. Yeah. But for also her excited. to yes. close it out by saying the power is in our hands, yes. that does give me a little bit of peace of mind. <laughs>
Yeah, um, we can always I, count on people to do the right thing. After they, we've done all the wrong yes. things, we'll get there in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they call her godmother of AI for a reason, it yeah. seems. Yeah, you're right about that. That was good. All right.